Welcome back to Sightlining Maryland and today as you can see I'm back in the uh, the fishing laboratory and I'm getting ready to start my second summer school session and today we're going to talk about the top five things that you should check before you get out on the water. Um, it's my belief that if you check these five things and I'm sure that certainly you could look into a few more but I was trying to keep it simple and, and short and sweet but if you check these five things before you head out you're going to have a much better day on the water. You're going to feel as if you, know, you have a good grasp of what it is it's going to take to be successful and you're going to hopefully put a few more fish in the net so i hope you enjoy and thanks for tuning in it is july july 3rd to be exact so tomorrow is july 4th so happy 4th of july to everybody watching this video no matter whether you're seeing it beforehand on july 4th or after i hope you guys have a good holiday um but the first thing i wanted to talk about with the five things i would check before i leave is going to be the weather um the weather sounds like something that you know doesn't need to necessarily be checked because it's summer um, it's gonna be hot you know that kind of going into it especially if you're here on the East Coast it's gonna be hot and humid um, for example today I don't even know if I should be doing summer school because the schools around here are all closed uh, for those that are still in session because we're under a heat advisory so you know what that tells me is that today when I check the weather and I see that you know Baltimore County is under a heat advisory as well as many other surrounding counties um, it basically tells me to stay off the water. If I were going to be going out today, there is no good reason why I would be out on the water after I would say nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and anytime during the afternoon and or even evening, it's gonna be pretty hot and muggy. Um, so I don't even know about fishing dusk per se, but if I were going out at all, it would have to be right at the crack of dawn. And even that is just not worth it. So when you see a weather forecast and it's got you under you know, in the summer, a heat advisory, or in the winter, it's gonna have you under some sort of like freeze warning or watch. It's probably giving you a little bit of credence to reconsider. It doesn't mean stay off the water, but it does mean that you should probably put a little bit more thought into uh, whether or not the trip is gonna be worth it for you today, because odds are, you know, the conditions aren't right. Now, the reality is though, when it comes to the weather, sometimes your schedule only allows for you to get out on the water certain times. And I've certainly been there where you just have to force a trip and you don't really have a choice. But the reality is if you have any flexibility to kind of pick a day or a time, um, kind of like I do in the summer, um, I'm gonna be hunting for certain windows. So for example, it is, as I mentioned, July 3rd. So the window I'm kind of hunting for is I would like in July temperatures to be in the 80s I'd like humidity to be low and that's mostly just for me so I can be comfortable but the reality is that's also going to lessen um the likelihood the water temperatures have spiked. Um, I probably want a couple consistent days in the 80s because just because you have one day in the 80s but the three days before we're all in the 90s the reality is the water temperature is going to be up really high and that one day just isn't enough to cool it off. So try to find a pattern, a pattern of, you know, two or three days, preferably three, that all fit in the range of what you're looking for. So in the summer, I'm looking for 80s, low humidity. I would even prefer, to be honest, some rain, not heavy, and we're not talking like an inch a day, but, you know, if I got a, a quarter of an inch or even a third of an inch, um, you know, once or twice in that three-day window, I knew it was going to be hazy, or not hazy, excuse me, overcast, and I knew that essentially that water is going to be on the cooler side that's going to be what I'm hunting for as I'm looking for kind of my summer window to fish the reality is if you go out on a bluebird day so like the skies are just all bright blue there's not a cloud in there and the sun's out even if it was 80 degrees those aren't optimum conditions because the reality is you're going to cast shadows onto the water that are more easily seen on those sunny days by the fish so when I'm out looking for again water that I want to you know fish for and weather that's going to fit what I'm looking for I'm probably looking for temperatures on the lower side in the summer, less humidity, and just something that I'm gonna be ultimately comfortable in and the fish aren't gonna be as easily able to see me because if it rains, it's gonna put a little stain on the water so you can kind of approach the fish a little bit more closely. If you have clouds in the sky, it's gonna lessen the ability to have your shadow cast onto the water, therefore the fish aren't gonna easily be able to see you again. So I'm doing everything in my power to control the odds the fish aren't gonna be able to see me, therefore I'm more likely to put those fish in my net. One of the best times to go is gonna be that morning uh, window. And if you're up, for example, um, at the earliest part where dawn is just kind of upon us and in July you're talking that's about 530 in the morning I mean I recently just took a uh, trip to Penn's Creek uh, with a buddy Scott of mine and unfortunately the the roads didn't quite allow for us to get to the water as early as we wanted but the reality was we both kind of agreed the best time for the bite was going to be in that early part of the day being on the water at 530 
and probably getting a solid bite into uh, a nine or 10 o'clock hour. So that's gonna be when the temperatures are low. In the summer, you're gonna be in the 50s or 60s more than likely, um, depending upon where you're at, of course. You know, it could certainly be in the 70s if you're in kind of a heat wave. Um, but the reality is you wanna be out on the water early. You're gonna get the most out of that window, probably a solid three to five hours of good fishing. And yeah, it's great, you know, at night to catch a spinner fall, but that window is going to be so small that it almost seems like, you know, you're chasing, um, you know, an hourglass of time that you're going to be able to fish. So I personally, when I'm looking at the weather, I want to see what time the sun's coming up, what are the temperatures going to be like, and uh, what's the most I can do to get out on that water as soon as that sun's coming up. Um, I'm going to dress for the conditions. So if I know that I'm going in the morning and it's going to be in the 50s or 60s, you know, I'm probably going to have maybe in the summer, as crazy as it sounds, some long sleeves. I'm going to be in, you know, long pants for waiting or my waiters. Um, so you have to look at that weather and plan ahead and dress appropriately, you know, given what you got. Obviously in the winter or fall, you know, the things are going to change. But right now, if you're looking to get out on that water, try the morning bite, try to make sure that it's overcast, try to hit, you know, somewhere in the 50s or 60s and that's going to probably increase your likelihood that the fish are most active because that water temperature is going to be at a prime which we're going to be talking about a little bit later so the second thing that i want to check before i leave the house and i do this regularly even when i'm not fishing i check in on days leading up to a trip is i check what's called the usgs and this particular website what it provides me is is it gives me for most, not all, but most uh, bodies of water, it's going to tell me what the water level is. Um, the one thing that it doesn't always provide for every stream, which is a little annoying, but hey, they're, um, they're providing us a great service by just giving us the water levels. And um, the thing that I don't always see is going to be the temperature. Um, so that's why you should probably take a thermometer with you. And we're going to talk about gear in an upcoming segment of this video. But for now, the second thing I would check is the USGS. All right. When it comes to the USGS, I've found that um, depending upon what body of water, because the smaller the river or the bigger the river, it affects what levels are you trying to fish. Um, but I've found that even when I'm fishing a medium to larger sized river, I generally don't like fishing when the CFS, the cubic feet per second, I don't like fishing um, in anything really above 350 to, to definitely 400. I found that I'm uncomfortable um, in that water. There's other fishermen that are going to, you know, handle that much, much better than I ever will, especially if you're doing competition angling and you have no choice or, you know, you're somebody that's out on the water frequently. Um, but you certainly you know, learn how to adapt. But I found that again, uh, a nice 300 to 400, somewhere in that range is gonna be good. Anything in the 100s is gonna be great, um, especially for your medium to small rivers. If you're at 100 CFS to 150, I would call that kind of ideal. On the bigger rivers, that's gonna be low. Um, but what I like about that is it makes um, the river a lot more readable, okay? So if I'm fishing 150 CFS on a small river, yeah, it's gonna be a little, um, a little high, but that also means the fish are gonna be actively moving around because they have more water to, to kind of um, be in. Whereas if I'm on a bigger river and that USGS is at 150, that tells me they're gonna be kind of held more so in smaller pockets of water um, and being condensed to kind of the areas that are a little bit deeper and I can pick those areas apart a lot more. But if it's up at 350 to 400, I would tell you to not steer clear, but definitely be very, very careful waiting. I just fished pens last week and it was in the, I wanna say 360 range. And I personally was kind of slipping and sliding around. It was putting pressure on my legs and I had to be really, really careful with every single step about where I was going and what I was doing. Whereas if that would have been 250 to 300, I probably felt a lot more comfortable. I would have been able to walk all sides of the river. So it's imperative that you check the USGS before you leave for a trip because it's gonna allow you to do two things. Check the river levels and it's also gonna be able to um, help you maybe check the temperature which is another critical factor we'll talk about soon so the third thing that you want to check before you leave for a trip or for your fishing trip for the day is you're gonna to want to check local reports so I really think in this third particular step of what to do there are actually three things that you should do when checking and the first thing I would check would be kind of your local shops. So for example, if I was in PA, uh, TCO does an excellent job of posting all the different main rivers um, 
and they give like eight to 10 different river reports. They update it typically daily, although some streams are better than others for which ones they update. Certain ones it's every day, certain ones it could be, you know, every two out of three or maybe once every week or so, depending upon the time of year. Um, but TCO does an excellent job of giving you, you know, what are the conditions, what's the CFS, what's the water temperature, what flies are working, what type of strategy. So not only are they giving you a stream kind of like update of what the main criteria is, but they're giving you the tips and techniques to get out there and catch some fish. When it comes to fishing more locally, I typically check some of my local fly shops on Facebook or I'll check their actual site and they'll post kind of the stream reports or kind of a guided um, update of how a trip just went with one of their clients. So these are really, really critical components similar to TCO of explaining, you know, what's working on the water, what the conditions are like and how I should approach the water. So I'll start with checking maybe a TCO if I'm in PA. Uh, if I'm going to fish in Maryland, I'm going to check some of the local fly shops. And then the last thing I might do is I'll check YouTube, which is exactly what you're doing right now. Um, I check YouTube because Typically, what that'll do is I can at least look at older film because, for example, we don't always film and upload that same day. It might not even be in that same week. Um, we're all guilty of getting caught up with other things. So by the time a video goes up, if it was recorded a week ago, it's too late. Okay, The conditions have changed immensely. So what I can do, though, is maybe look at older film. You know, if there's somebody that consistently posts um, and I see that they have multiple July films, I'm going to look for maybe a pattern or a theme of, you know, maybe last July. What was it fishing like around July 4th if they have a video or two that's up around then? And then I'm going to see how my conditions are currently that match theirs. And it gives me a little bit of insight, especially if I check multiple channels. We started talking about, you know, checking local fly shops as well as YouTube. The last thing I would check is going to be blogs. Blogs are great because people are going to post the details of their trip. Um, they're going to explain, you know, the conditions when they first got out of the car to the midday to maybe even the end, um, there are some really, really good you know, people when it comes to giving um, blogs about local streams because of the fact that they're trying to log that for themselves. That way, the next time they're on the water around this time, they have an archive of just information. So that way they don't have to do a whole lot of thinking. You know, all of that process that went into that day, they came home, they explained it to themselves, but shared it with other people. And now you have the chance to absorb that information, you know, and use it to your benefit, even though more than likely that person was using it to their own to kind of think about that process and what it was like and hopefully utilize it again in the future. So those are the three things that I would say apply to our third tip about checking your resources before you go. So our fourth tip for today, the uh, the next thing that I would say applies to our summer school session number two. Before I leave for a trip, I need to make sure that I have all of my equipment. And equipment is something that you need to pay close attention to because we, as we start to progress in this sport, we have a lot of tools. Um, and the best thing we can do is try to keep them all organized to a, a tackle box or the fly box or the chest pack or the hip pack, wherever it is that we're putting a lot of our equipment and um you know, just little things that help us to get through a day. We want to keep it all kind of together as best we can. I think that goes without saying, but there's nothing worse than leaving for a trip and realizing you don't have all of your equipment. I can honestly say that I've left for a trip and forgot my waders and boots. Uh, this was in October and luckily the water temperature because of the summer, it had kind of stayed warm and the water temperature in October was still in the 50s or 60s, um, so I was able to wet weight it, but in October, that's not ideal. Had that trip in November or April and I forget my waders and boots, that's gonna completely ruin the trip and maybe even make me reconsider, am I gonna fish? So. Um, I wanna talk about all of the things that you should remember when you're leaving for a trip, and it starts with a rod. Obviously, you wanna make sure you leave with that. Um, you also need to make sure that you have your reel um, to pair that with the right rod, especially if you have more than one, okay? The next thing that you need is your fly boxes, and I've also been guilty about leaving a fly box behind. Um, I don't think I've ever left a bag behind, but I have certainly left a, a box specifically with the certain types of flies that I felt like were gonna execute a positive trip for me. Um, so make sure you leave with that. So you got rod, reel, fly boxes, Next, make sure you bring a net, okay? Um, I have seen people in videos when they don't have a net, they can use a hat, and that's great when you're catching small brook trout or brown trout, um, but if you get into a you know 15 plus inch fish and you don't have a net, um, you're gonna wish that you had brought one with you because it is not easy to beach a large fish and just bring it in by hand. So do not ever forget your net, and um, even sometimes when you bring a net, you might accidentally leave it in a car, which I've been guilty of doing too. 
The next thing that depending upon, you know, if you're now like me where you're starting to record, you got to bring all of your um, recording accessories. So you're going to need a tripod potentially. You're going to need, you know, your head mount. You're going to need your GoPro. You're going to need, you know, the casing uh, as well as just all the different things like an extra battery or, you know, a, a charger, which I've now started bringing on the stream with me to make sure that the batteries don't die out on me, an extra memory card. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the recording side of this that I'm starting to learn on and still have a lot to learn. But, um, you know, the GoPro and all its accessories, you got to make sure you take with you and pack up correctly. The last couple things that I would make sure that I brought with me whenever it uh, comes to packing for a trip is I'm going to want my wading socks. So I have some specific uh, wading socks and some people have a couple different types, one for winter, one for you know, summer and spring to kind of differentiate the types of um, thickness you have to keep your feet warmer. But make sure you take a good pair of wading socks. The other thing that I would make sure that I brought is going to be polarized glasses. Um, you know, polarized glasses are obviously going to help you see into the water, uh, reduce that glare, hopefully see those fish a little bit more clearly. That way you don't spook them um, just by walking up on them blindly. So bring, you know, a pair of uh, polarized glasses. So I typically bring like, um, not that you need to listen to this tip on exactly what I bring so that you bring it, but just saying like I bring food. So I have a snack like a Cliff Bar or a Nature Valley Bar or a Nutri-Green Bar. I want something to provide me a little bit of energy or pick me up in the middle of the day because um, usually I'll eat breakfast and leave. I'll fish for a good six to eight hours and I'll eat somewhere right in that middle of the day part to hold me over until I get home. Um, but I'm thinking when I leave the house, I need a bottle of water or two um, and I'm going to need a snack to kind of get me through that way I'm not spending you know ten to twenty dollars on the road just because I didn't plan ahead the final thing that I would say that I need to make sure that I bring outside of the food and water is I'm gonna want to bring a waiting belt with me um, and maybe even a waiting staff I don't personally have a staff I know that some people depending upon age will definitely have it with them I notice you know, as you get into the sport and you see the um, the older fly fishermen, the more experienced ones that know a lot more, they might bring one because it helps them to feel comfortable. They may bring one because of their age. I don't know. Um, I definitely think that they're probably in the smarter group of people because I, I myself probably think that I should have one on me uh, whenever I go out because it would really help for when I'm losing my footing. Um, but I think the waiting belt is important because I have fished in that 300 to 400 CFS and I found that whenever I'm fishing that, um, sometimes I chance whether or not I'm going to be taking on water if I take a small dip. So don't forget a wading belt. Um, I've mentioned that before in other videos, um, the importance of that to make sure that that way if you do go under, the water doesn't go all the way through um, your waders and ultimately weigh you down. So those are all the critical components that I think are needed when it comes to equipment, all the fly gear, all the recording gear, um, and just tactical fishing things that I'll need whenever I hit the water. And the fifth and final tip in this video today is gonna be to bring extra, okay? So I don't think everybody's got extra waders and boots lying around, and I don't think you really need them realistically, unless of course uh, maybe you got a friend tagging along, but um, some things that I really think that you should bring extra of are gonna be just starting with an extra rod. So I had fished before and made the rookie mistake of out in Western Maryland. I took one rod, you know, I felt it was my best rod. It was gonna be versatile enough so that I could fish a variety of different water. And I got hung up in a tree. I went to grab for, you know, the uh, the line that instead of snapping off and losing one fly, I decided I would try to get it out. And while I did that, I ended up stepping on my rod because the water swept it right underneath my feet and broke a $400 plus dollar rod. Downfall was I didn't have an extra one with me. So now basically on every trip that I do, um, I bring two rods. In the event that I make a mistake where it gets closed in the door, I accidentally step on it, maybe a fish breaks it. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, but if you're an hour and a half Half, two hours, three hours, even five minutes from home, um, when you break that rod, it's obviously going to ruin your day, but there's nothing worse than compounding that by not having an extra one so that you can get back to fishing um, and hopefully bring down your anxiety a little bit by bringing another fish to net um, since you've already broken one rod. The next thing that I would bring is an extra pair of glasses. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, depending upon the lenses, um, it's going to basically 
make so that uh, the amber lens is better than a gray lens or a blue lens is better than a yellow lens. Um, so if you have two different types of lenses, it may help you to see through that water a little bit more clearly or in the event you accidentally lose a pair, leave a pair sitting down or they fall off into the water, um, you're gonna want that extra pair you know, either on you or in the car. Next, um, you know, I'm gonna bring extra food and water with me because of the fact that some days it could be hotter than what I anticipated. I could end up hungrier than what I anticipated. Um, it's just a good rule of thumb to have extra water or food on you so that way you can feel comfortable on the water or if you ate it all while you're out there and now you got a two or three hour ride ahead of you, you know, you have something kind of sitting there on ice or just ready for you when you get in the car. And the very final thing that you should bring extra of is extra clothes. There is probably nothing worse than filling your waders with water all throughout your feet and on your legs, and then you get into the car and now you smell like mildew, your feet and legs are all sopping wet, um, and you gotta drive two or three hours home while you know kind of sopping wet. So I'll bring an extra pair of shorts, I'll bring an extra pair of socks, um, you know, basically I want extra clothes. And for example, I mentioned before that I took a dip when it was above 400 CFS in one of the PA streams that I fished. Um, when I went under, I was very thankful that I had extra long sleeves in the car. I had an extra t-shirt in the car. Um, you know, luckily it was just my upper body that got wet, but I had an extra set of everything so that I could feel comfortable fishing the rest of that day. But it was great to know that I had a little bit of extra of everything in that car. That way I could fish comfortably the rest of that day due to the fact that I had planned ahead and had some extra things. So, to wrap it all up, um, thank you guys for tuning in and kind of listening to what are the five different things um, that I kind of check or do when I'm planning ahead for a trip. These are things that you can do the night before, you can do the morning um, of before you get out of there. But um, you know, hopefully this summer school session for number two kind of gave you some tips of things that maybe you hadn't been thinking about or some resources that maybe now you'll start kind of checking into. So thank you guys for tuning in and I'll be on vacation next week so there won't be any fishing videos or any informational videos for summer school so I'll have to pick back up with that after I get back but um, hopefully thus far you've enjoyed them uh, we've got two down I still have another you know fishing video to upload I'm gonna fish one more time before you know I get out of here so happy 4th of July and um, best of luck the next time you guys hit the water enjoy